All right, hi everyone. <laughs> I think we'll get things started. Uh, they've sorted out the live stream link, so make sure you've pushed that out to all your channels. Um, I'm Mackenzie Wilson. Thank you so much for being here today. I'm the program manager for the Step Up Coalition, and I'm a member of the Mission 2020 team. For those of you who haven't heard of Mission 2020, uh, we're a climate action group that was convened by Christiana Figueres, the former secretary of the UNFCCC, and she was responsible for bringing together countries and leaders from all over the world to the 2015 Paris Agreement. And before we get started, I would just like to pose a question to the room. I originally was going to include a live online poll so that we could engage with our peers who are joining in from the web, but we have some technical difficulties. Wouldn't be a presentation about tech with some, without some difficulties. So instead, we'll do a raise of hands. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to just ask the question, why should tech take climate action seriously? Um, there are two, two options. One is it's just the right thing to do. And two, it's a great business opportunity. So can I get a raise of hands for who thinks it's the right thing to do? Great. <laughs> and who thinks it's a great business opportunity? Right, so it's a, it's a bit of a trick question. <laughs> um, there's no right or wrong answer. So climate action is the right thing to do, and I'm definitely preaching to a room of, of people who think so. The latest science tells us that global greenhouse gas emissions need to start declining by 2020. That's next year. Hence the name of my organization, Mission 2020. We want to help bend the curve of emissions by 2020. So we really need to get our act together. Um, and furthermore, we need to reach net zero by 2050. And to do that, we need to have emissions every decade. So we need to have emissions by 2030, by 2040, and ultimately be net zero by 2050. So we have our challenge set out for us. Um, but of course, those are ambitious goals, and to achieve them, we need everyone to step up. We need the private sector to step up. We can't wait for the public sector to put policy in place to guide our own actions. It's up to us. Um, and we need to be practical about that, and for the private sector to take action at the scale and speed that we need, uh, it has to make good business sense. And fortunately, it does. Um, the low carbon economy represents a tremendous business opportunity. Uh, tackling climate change can unlock an estimated $26 trillion investment opportunity. Um, so companies that invest in the low carbon future and make the jump to net zero operations will be rewarded. So traditionally, when we talk about reducing greenhouse gas emissions, we're often focusing on the really obvious emitters, the aviation, steel, cement production, shipping, long distance transport. Just those five sectors alone account for 27% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So it seems like a pretty obvious place to start. But we're here today to talk about the role that tech can play. And why are we, why are we here? Tech, after all, according to the latest science, accounts for only 1.4% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So it's, it's not nothing, but it's not 27%. But the authors of the recently published Exponential Roadmap Report, which I hope all of you have the chance to read and check out if you have not already, they estimate that tech has the potential to reduce 15% of fossil fuel emissions by 2030. And out of the remaining 85%, tech can indirectly support the reduction of an additional 35% through influencing things like consumer and business decisions and just transforming systems. So we really do have tremendous reach. And again, these estimates make sense given where tech is today. Today, over 5 billion people have mobile phones. Half of those are smartphones. The number of people with mobile phones, that's increasing 4% year over year. Today, over 4 billion people have access to the internet, and that number is growing 7% year over year, 20% if you look at just Africa alone. So it goes without saying that tech companies influence the behavior of billions and billions of people, 
and tech companies understand the power of exponential transformation through their platforms and services that they develop and make available to all of us. So today, we stand on the precipice of a technological revolution that will fundamentally alter the way we work, live, and interact with people. And for those of you who may have cracked open your old high school textbooks and notes, you might recall that the first industrial revolution used water and steam power to mechanize production. The second industrial revolution used electric power to create mass production and the third industrial revolution used electronics and information technology to automate that production. And now, according to the World Economic Forum, we're entering the fourth industrial revolution. And it's characterized by the fusion of technologies and the blurring of the lines between the physical, digital, and biological spheres. The fourth industrial revolution, of which many of us in this room are a part, is proceeding at an exponential rate rather than linear. And it's disrupting, or is poised to disrupt very shortly, nearly every industry around the globe. So the fourth industrial revolution, again, represents a significant opportunity that this group right here and outside of this room has to make an impact on the future of our planet and society. There are an unlimited number of possibilities that come from billions of people and things being connected to the internet with unprecedented levels of processing power, access to knowledge, data analytics. So let's just take a few moments to imagine some of the ways that the technology of today, and more importantly, of the future, can guide our own climate action journeys and help us create the future that we need. Imagine if, when you opened a ride-sharing app on your phone, you were presented with a low-carbon, or even a no-carbon, mode of transportation, rather than the traditional internal combustion engine vehicles that dominate our transportation networks today. Imagine if, when you pulled up directions to go from point A to point B, one of the key metrics that you saw was the environmental footprint of that journey and that you could choose your route, not just based on time and distance, but based on the environmental impact as well. Imagine if when you were online shopping, looking for that pair of shoes or that purse, or your phone or your laptop, rather than just seeing the sticker price of that item, you also saw the environmental cost that was involved in producing it and making it available to you. What if that price included the cost of the deforestation or mining for those materials, the cost of transporting those materials to the factory that they were produced, the cost of the power to power the factory where it was produced and then ship it to you, and the cost of cleaning up the microplastics in, plastics in 10, 20, 30 years from now from that item? Imagine if you were watching a video online, texting your friends, emailing your colleagues at work, reading a news article. Imagine that you as a consumer saw the environment, environmental metrics of all of those actions and services. It's a bit of an invisible footprint today, but the people, the companies in this room, and those that are in our network have the power to change that. And these are all very real solutions that could be implemented today. And they all focus on one very key facet of the fourth industrial revolution access to knowledge and data transparency. And because one of the first and most important steps that companies of the fourth industrial revolution can do to accelerate the climate action journey is to make data accessible, it's very important to develop solutions that allow us to better measure our own footprint and to act on it as well. Measurement goes hand in hand with progress. If we don't know our start and end points, we really can't say with confidence that we're doing enough. And this is an area in which step-up companies are emerging as leaders. Step-up members, through their platforms and services, are empowering architects and engineers to understand the footprint of a building before it's built. They're helping companies and the public sector understand the footprint of our transportation networks and travel patterns. And they're embedding sustainability best practices 
into centralized, centralized carbon accounting platforms that help key decision makers understand where they need to direct their action and resources. So to that end, I'm pleased to introduce Patrick Flynn, B VP of Sustainability at Salesforce, and he's going to share how Salesforce is leveraging its platform and sustainability experience and expertise to accelerate climate action, not only for Salesforce, but for its customers as well. So please give him a warm welcome. Thank you, Mackenzie. Uh, Mackenzie joined the, the Step Up team a couple of months ago, and the impact is already um, just incredible. So really, truly, thank you. I'm so inspired by this group and what it can bring to the planet at this critical moment in history. Let's all start with a big, deep breath of 415 part per million air. <laughs> You know, Paul Hawken would remind us the, the atmosphere isn't out there. It's not something that we look at on a computer screen or a weather map. The atmosphere is here. It's in us. Um, it's a great honor to be here with you today. Thank you. Um, uh, often I'm struck by this feeling, this is the room, right? Um, this conference is full of the people that will turn things around for us in the next year. There's not some better equipped room halfway around the world with more innovative companies in it trying to tackle this challenge. Um, you could either interpret that as daunting, the pressure that that brings, or to me, just incredibly inspiring. Um, my name's Patrick. I lead sustainability at Salesforce, a Fortune 500 company, the world's number one CRM, um, a company built on core values, trust, customer success, innovation, and equality. And all of those show up in our sustainability work, in our climate action work, in particular equality. We know that climate change is an inequality amplifier. It's caused primarily by the privileged and its impacts, unfortunately, are felt most by the most disadvantaged communities. Um, so it is a, the right thing to do, it's an important thing to do, and here today I'm gonna talk to you about the business implications of climate change. You're stuck with just me for the next 10 or 15 minutes. By the end, we'll get through a live demo of Salesforce Sustainability Cloud. Beforehand, I'm just gonna set the stage a little bit. Um, when it comes to our sustainability programs at Salesforce, all of our products are delivered carbon neutral every single day. We offset all of our employee um, commuting and business travel. We'll hit 100% renewable energy in the next few years entirely from new renewable energy that we helped bring onto the grid. Um, and we're, we're embarking on the most exciting step yet. Uh, the launch just last week of Salesforce Sustainability Cloud and without any further ado, a quick shout out to the amazing Shen Yuan Su sitting here. Uh, the trailblazer of the story who, who built uh, the product. <laughs> um, we will be talking about the future. Um, and with that, a quick reminder, Salesforce is a public company, so please make sure all of your purchasing decisions based on publicly available data and technology that's out there today. We start with thank you. Thank you again, Mackenzie. Thank you to the Climate Group. How many Step Up Coalition company members do we have in here? I see a bunch. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for your leadership. Uh, thank you for the Salesforce team that's here. Thank you to everybody. Um, we talked about the fourth industrial revolution, all four of them already, so I'll be a little bit uh, more brief. Um, Salesforce, our core competency is business transformation. We help all of our 150,000 customers move through the changes in their industries. Um, and with Salesforce Sustainability Cloud, what we've done is enabled them to move through what Al Gore would call the sustainability revolution, what some are called, calling the fifth industrial revolution. They come quickly these days, um, which is the use of technology to help the planet. Um, 
I think the sustainability revolution is really marked by a bunch of very predictable, very large scale macro trends. From a business perspective, I think climate change is the biggest and most predictable shift in the competitive landscape that any business could ever imagine. It's changing how investors view businesses and the sort of data that they're after no longer focused only on short-term earnings, but really thinking about the need for high-quality data around non-financial metrics, ESG metrics, um, in, in their evaluation of companies. We're definitely seeing it in terms of a shift in customer preferences. First felt strongest by the B2C businesses out there. They know that now their customers' purchasing decisions are a reflection of that customer's values. The logo on your shirt says something about what you believe in now in a way that it didn't used to. And what started as a B2C phenomenon is moving more and more to a B2B phenomenon. The businesses that your business does business with tell something about your values. And then employees. Um, you know, we're seeing um, firsthand how, how um, passionately the younger generations understand the crisis that we're in. And we know that employees, especially younger employees, um, are really focused on choosing a career with a company that is in line with their values. All of these present opportunities for companies to outcompete across every industry, across every geography. They also present risks and ways that a company might fall behind if they don't navigate appropriately. The numbers to support these shifts are completely staggering. Um, CEOs are saying that climate change is the number one risk to a company. Over $30 trillion is now investing in sustainable um, funds. And 44% of employees believe that their business is not doing enough to take action. That's the backdrop here. And what it's causing is the biggest gap that we've ever seen between the company and the small number of sustainability professionals inside that company and the data that they have to make strategic decisions. So quick show of hands, how many people have um, done greenhouse gas accounting before? Oh, wow, okay, so you know how terrible that is. It's as bad as the name sounds, right? Um, how many of you are what you'd consider sort of single sustainability professionals trying to juggle it all within your company? A few, okay. I know how hard that can be, I've been there before. Um, what we're seeing from all of our customers, every industry, is that all of a sudden, the CEO is coming calling, and the board of directors wants to meet with you, and other members of the C-suite are willing and ready to take action, and you need to come up with the C-suite caliber data to help inform that decision. It's exactly the gap that we felt at Salesforce not too long ago as we were bringing our internal programs to the state of maturity that I described before, and as we were shifting from not too long ago, about 80% of our sustainability team's efforts focused on things that were internal to the company, really making sure we walked the walk, and 20% more on the external things that are bigger than the four walls of Salesforce. And like any good sustainability program, you have to start with what's most material to you and most directly in your circle first and get your house in order. But then as quickly as possible, what we've done is shift to 2080 and try to think about putting as much of our sustainability team's resources towards those initiatives that have a chance to deliver impact at a scale that planet Earth might actually notice. Things that are 100x or 1,000x bigger than the four walls of Salesforce. And in order to pull off that strategic maneuver, we really had to rely on trusted data throughout. And we think we can help all of your companies and all of you go through that same critical transformation as quickly as possible to deliver the sort of impact that can bend the curve in the next year with the help of Salesforce Sustainability Cloud. 
And so what we're going to do now um, in just one moment is switch over. Let me just tell you about it in, in highlight form. Um, it's, it's a way to get trusted data onto uh, a, a system of record and a platform. It allows for data-driven insights. It, it leads to an auditable process like the one that Salesforce just went through. And really, I think most exciting for those of us in this room, it empowers the sustainability teams within the business who have the strategies. We know what to do. We know how to outcompete, but we are under-resourced time, effort, and data. And if we can empower those teams to have those strategic conversations up at the C-suite, up at the board of directors level, with the data on their fingertips that they can have on the fly to inform strategic decisions, I really think we can accelerate the climate action movement in the corporate sector. So I'll show you a little bit about the tool itself. What you saw there was sort of where the sustainability professional will live. We'll flip back to that in a moment. I want to start with what the executive might see, or how, in this case, Jeanette Wilson from DocuSign does her day. I'll be speaking with Amy in a minute here up on stage. What we've done is um, put up some dummy illustrative data for DocuSign to paint the picture of what it might look like for DocuSign to use this product. They've been one of our pilot customers this summer, so thank you, Amy. Thank you, DocuSign, for helping give feedback and inform it and give us the, the motivation and the confidence that we had really hit something special. So imagine being in an executive meeting, being Jeanette, and being asked a few questions about DocuSign's footprint. What you see here at the highest level is emissions over time, progress towards 100% renewable energy, other sustainability KPIs. Let's drill a little bit deeper into the emissions profile. Well, first up is a really helpful sense of the proportions of where the annual carbon footprint comes from. You can see data centers make up the vast majority of the emissions there, um, and all of this tied to the 285,000 tons of CO2 emissions each year. And we can drill further still. You've got emissions broken down by data center, office, travel, the annual growth rates, and you can quickly see in a meeting with the CEO, the sort of context that might help the strategic dis discussion. You know data centers are about 10 times bigger than real estate, and real estate itself is about 10 times bigger than travel. That can inform some really important strategic decisions. And you can go further still. So if we go down even underneath carbon emissions, we can see geographically where some of these emissions are coming from, top five cities and that might inform a public policy or government affairs engagement. It might help change your strategy around reducing office or, or data center emissions. So a very quick glimpse into one of the places where you can drill in. I, I know from experience, you know, you, you, without a tool like this, you spend a whole bunch of time bringing the data out of a tangled web of spreadsheets getting the formatting just right in the presentation, getting rid of the typos, and you walk in, and then the question is over in this direction here and not what you need on the next slide. Can you show it to me year over year? And it's like, yeah, give me, give me a month. I'm going to go <laughs> build another Excel model. I'm going to go build another presentation. And then you come back and show me just year over year North America. And you know? Off you go again. So the, the ability to have a on-the-fly strategic discussion with an executive, with the look and feel that the executive is used to, and be able to arrive at strategic decisions in that moment is a huge accelerator. But we all know a dashboard and a demo can be created um, in a way that they look really elegant. And the real power has to do with how you get the data into a dashboard like this and how trusted it is. So this is just really the tip of the iceberg. And here is the heart 
of Salesforce Sustainability Cloud and the place where the sustainability professional will live. Let me orient you for just a second. So, in a, you all know this, in an, in an annual footprinting process, you really sort of need to grab information from different sources across different categories. And we see those across the top. You've got air travel, company shuttles, data centers, ground travel, hotel stays, not me on the private jet, but some people on the, on the private jet, real estate, rental cars. The data is coming in from all sorts of different places in all different formats, and it needs to be brought into a really organized process. And that's what we've done here. And now, if we zoom in on data centers, for example, you can see we've got 31 of them. Those 31 are these white rectangles, and they move their way from right to left, or from your left to right, the same way a, a candidate that you're trying to hire might move through a hiring board, or the, the same way um, any sort of software development process moves through a Kanban flow. They, all of these cards started on the far left. First step is asset confirmation, really just setting up the vessel within which the data will be collected who is tied to it, where is it, what's the approval process going to look like. Then you start collecting the data. And now again, this can come in from automatic APIs, it can come in from scanned PDFs, it can be typed in, and as all of us know, especially for those smaller data centers or smaller offices, no data comes in at all. And tragically, what a lot of us spend our time on is chasing that last utility bill when even if it's off by 2x, 10x, it's never going to change the sort of visual and the, and the overall footprint at the end of the day. So extrapolation comes into play to really help. With a few clicks, you can plug those holes. You can also validate all of that data. So we've got visualization capabilities. So you can spot outliers, circle back, and try to adjust things. The application of renewable energy can, done, can be done in this tool. And then begins um, the, the sort of audit process where an internal reviewer can come in and take a look at the data that we've got customized dashboards, again, for spotting outliers, for drilling in, for normalizing data, and then the external audit begins. And for the external auditors, this is a game changer because what it used to be is that somebody in my position wraps up a whole bunch of Excel spreadsheets and dumps them on the desk of the audit firm. Now we give them a login and they get to experience an organized structure just like this one, ask their own questions in their test, drill into the data and answer the questions themselves. So let's imagine we're an auditor for a second and we're interested in a particular real estate site. So we'll move over to real estate. We'll check out Madison Avenue. This is somebody doing the internal audit process. And here's what an individual record looks like. We've got the sort of fundamental things for this office building, like its location, address, size, what grid it's on, who the utility is. We've got some of the high-level data in a, in a quick little visual here, energy consumption over time. As we scroll down a little bit further, we can look at some of the the carbon source data and the consumption summary, all of the energy and how it's used, electricity, non-electricity sources of energy, renewable energy details and how that's applied. And one of my favorites are these data quality metrics that will raise flags if something seems off that inform the sort of visualization tools that enable somebody in the internal audit position to see if anything's off base. But Jeanette here checks it out. Everything seems to be on track. And so with a, with a couple of clicks, she can submit this for approval. That can trigger an automatic update to the external auditor that the building is in their court, and they can begin their own questioning. So again, the, the heart here is an organized process for doing the annual footprinting. And then once all of that data is at a level of trust, then it can inform these these dashboards on the mobile device of the executives and enable strategy at the pace that the planet needs. 
So I'll pause there. We're going to have some time for Q&A towards the end. Thank you for taking a look at it with me. Um, and we'll tell you some more in a little bit. Thank you very much, Patrick, for giving us the, uh, the uh, inside scoop on the new, new product. It's super exciting. I know it'll be really helpful for a lot of folks in this room. Um, I'd like to now invite Patrick again <laughs> to <laughs> up, so don't sit down there for too long. As well as Amy Skeeters Barron from DocuSign's Impact Fund. And we're going to go over a couple of questions. Test the mics. Hello, hello. <laughs> so thank you so much, Patrick, as I said, for giving us a walkthrough of this exciting new product. Um, and I know that you've had several customers who were helping pilot it this summer, and Amy was one of them. So Amy, I'd love to learn a little bit more before we jump into your, I know you're excited to talk about how your experience went with the product, but first, if you could just share a little bit about yourself, um, your role at DocuSign, what DocuSign is about, as well as DocuSign Impact, that would be really helpful. Well, Mackenzie, I'm delighted to be here, and thank you to Patrick, Sonia, and the rest of the Salesforce team for including DocuSign. I see Ari in the back as well, Sue. Uh, it's been a really wonderful experience working with uh, all of the, the Salesforce uh, folks here. So the first thing, though, bef before I get into DocuSign, and, and of course, our, our story is, we also were not flying on private jets, so it was for demo purposes only, uh, but helpful to see the capabilities of the tool and slicing and dicing however your company might operate. But so again, Amy skeeters Barons from DocuSign. I'm the executive director of our DocuSign Impact Initiative. And DocuSign Impact is our global social and environmental initiative to maximize the company's positive impacts on the world. Uh, on its people and, and, of course, on the planet. We are, uh, in terms of our branded DocuSign Impact Initiative, about five years into the journey, we have focused on a model that will be also familiar to our Salesforce friends here in the room, the 111 model of our intention to donate 1% of our products, 1% of our people's time, and 1% of our profits to philanthropic causes over time. Last year, and I should say in those four or five years of this journey, we have really focused on the volunteering capability. Our employees get three volunteer time off days that the company sponsors every year. Uh, we, as part of our stepped up, actually stepped up, independent of the step up, but our stepped up commitment to philanthropic causes last year, we committed a, a donation of $30 million to the DocuSign Impact Foundation over the next 10 years. And that's allowed us to put additional resources in the hands of our employees through our matching gifts program. And also opened up a, a whole new avenue of impact for the company in terms of the environmental commitments that we wanted to make, that we want to make. So one thing that we launched last year, McKinsey, I know you are aware of, Patrick, is DocuSign for Forest. And it is that umbrella concept of everything that the company wants to do with respect to our environmental impact. So what we know about DocuSign and what we, what we know as DocuSign is that since the very beginning of our journey in 2003, the company has been taking paper out of the equation. Most of you will know DocuSign for our e-signature capabilities, and that is still the core, the heart of our company and what we do. Over time, however, we've also layered on additional capabilities to form what we refer to as the DocuSign Agreement Cloud, which allows companies, which allows our over 500,000 customers and millions of users, hundreds of millions of users worldwide, to uh, take advantage of is to basically prepare, sign, act on, and manage agreements all within the DocuSign Agreement Cloud. So you know it's for your signature, but when you think about an agreement, you're thinking about how do you bounce that back and forth to get before you get to signature, who needs to get a copy after it's signed, and what do you do with the data uh, after within the document and the agreement after it's signed. So the, uh, our goal as a company has long been you know, sustainability has long been a part of the company, and our goal has been how do we make it a part and parcel of the company, and this idea of being more agreeable and our agreement cloud. Thank you for that. Um, a lot of great things happening. 
Um, you, you briefly mentioned the DocuSign for Forest initiative. Can you just explain a little bit more about how the sustainability cloud that you had the opportunity to, to pilot uh, fits into that initiative? Certainly. So DocuSign for Forest is comprised of our e-signature impact calculator, which allows all of our customers to, to uh, check and, and um, analyze, basically, if the numbers of sheets of, of uh, documents that are going through the DocuSign Agreement cloud were paper, how much wood is that, how much water, how much waste, and how much carbon. Additionally, DocuSign for Forest is our philanthropic commitment to forest-focused organizations. And then finally, how we empower our employees to make the difference in their communities and a positive impact on the environment as well. So the sustainability cloud has been fundamental to us insofar as our own impacts as a company are, are foundational. We, we have to understand what they are. We have to be able to track them over time. And we have to be able to share that data, as Patrick mentioned, with members of whether it's the board, whether it's our e-staff, whether it's executives and, and others throughout the company to be able to understand, analyze, and manage uh, those impacts. So it's been, it's been really interesting uh, in terms of our participation you know, from earlier this year, as well as seeing it come to fruition and now be a, a marketable product. Well, Certainly sounds like it's, it's having an impact, and the sustainability cloud is having an impact in DocuSign's world. Patrick, it, it's great to see it. Finally, I've heard so much. Um, I sit with Patrick's team in San Francisco, and I've been hearing about it, but hadn't been able to see it till today. So great to get a sneak preview. Um, you touched on this a little bit in your presentation. Can you just explain a little bit more about what really inspired you and the Salesforce sustainability team to build this solution in the first place? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, it goes. It actually brings us back a couple of years, um, and the the theme of the story is actually that mega trend we talked about in the investor community. Um, for starters, our CFO Mark Hawkins, who will be helping launch tomorrow the East Coast chapter of Prince Charles's Accounting for Sustainability Network. Um, he's been a champion within Salesforce for sustainability for as long as I've been at the company. Um, and with his leadership, Salesforce was the first technology company to sign on to the Task Force for Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, TCFD. Um, and with that came this really um, stark recognition that overnight, our environmental data needed to look a lot like our financial data in terms of how fast we could generate it, how accurate it was, and through which channels we would provide it through to our stakeholders. And so that very same year, we had the data um, undergo a limited assurance by one of the big four audit firms. Um, and yet the timeline was quite long. Um, I think like most of you, we were looking at a six-month process to do the annual footprinting, chasing those last utility bills, dragging things across the finish line. Um, and it was a very stable process, but it wasn't getting any better, and it was certainly too slow. And so just this past year, we used Salesforce sustainability ourselves for the first time. And on our first try, our, our, our footprinting process went from six months down to six weeks. We actually beat the finance team meaning we, we, had, we had our annual data ready for the 10K before the finance team had its data ready for the 10K. And we got the data in. We still had that limited assurance by one of the big four audit firms. And it was such a success for us that we started sort of with, a set, with a level of sort of cautious hope, exploring with some of our customers whether what we had built for ourselves might be a good fit for them too because we've all seen software that promises to deliver on something like this we had even used it and then gone back to spreadsheets and as we talked to even some of the most innovative software companies in the world many of them were in the exact same place as us back on spreadsheets too slow not trusted certainly not integrated to any sort of data visualization platform seamlessly um, and so that started the, the pilot program. Um, first to get confirmation that what we had built would be helpful, but also to start informing product roadmap, right? And make sure that we build something that can be used by 
all of our customers, um, not just not just those um, who look exactly like us. It's quite the journey. <laughs> um, so beyond DocuSign, what what Amy has shared um, with DocuSign's experience, what else are you hearing from customers who've been a part of that pilot program? Sure. Um, you know, one thing we're hearing quite a lot is actually from customers who are not part of the pilot program across a whole diversity of industries um, at, a, at a level that we've never seen it before. Um, you know, CEO to CEO um, conversations where a company has looked to Salesforce in the past to help it transform through a change in its, in, in its competitive landscape and are coming to us again as a trusted advisor to, ha to seek our help in this sustainability journey. And it's, you know, every industry, every geography, and many of them have industry-specific needs um, and want us to move towards manufacturing or CP, computer, um, consumer packaged goods or retail. Um, and we will develop in all of those areas as well uh, over time. Um, but the, the reassuring thing is, Every business has offices and data centers and employees that travel around and stay at hotels and commute to work. So we, we actually, um, in, a, in a nice way, have still hit what is really foundational to any company's scope one and scope two emissions for sure, and a lot of the relevant scope three emissions out there to provide this trusted foundation and then from there um, expand. And, and I would just say, McKinsey, that, that for us for we at DocuSign being a customer of Salesforce, an existing customer, that this is a natural extension of how we might use the platform, how we are using the platform. And that idea that there is a, a central source where over time we can yeah, look at the trends in our data and measure the impacts. Also, to Patrick's points about the data visualization and the insights, understand and really move from measuring and, and collecting data to actually generating insights that help us up-level our own efforts, um, that, that help us effectively move in-house just that, that process of measuring and understanding and use our discretionary resources to actually address the insight, address the things that we're seeing. We're like, oh, goodness, data center in XYZ location, or wow, functional area, air you know, wh whatever that is, uh, it is really helpful to us. Yeah, and, and I'll say uh, in the, a couple of things along those lines that we heard consistently, one was almost every meeting started with a, you know, I was a little skeptical at first about this about this idea of software for footprinting, and yet I'm really intrigued, and and I'm I'm interested in seeing more. So um, that was that was cool to hear that that we had hit something a little bit new, and I think a lot of that has to do with number one, the marriage of system of record, year over year data in a really stable place combined with the data visualization tool that puts all of that information distilled into the pocket of the executive. So uh, shifting tax a little bit um, away from just sustainability cloud and the, the impact it has on your business today and, and planning for the future, but speaking of the future, um, you know, we have an incredible audience here in the room and just at the Climate Hub in general, and, and I'd like to take this opportunity to ask both of you what your vision is for the future. I mean, what do, what do we need to ask our own companies and others to do to step up um, to make sure that we are creating the future that we need? Um, and, and really, what else can tech do? Now is your opportunity. <laughs> well, the first thing, I, I will kick it off. And the, the first thing I would say is, for DocuSign, just the opportunity to contribute in this way is really important. And for how many of you, I, I'm just curious in the audience here, and how many of you are West Coast, US, any, any Silicon Valley folks? We've got a few. Other East Coast, US, Europe, few, and other parts of Asia, APAC, Africa. Okay, super. So, well, 
So it seems like we have a nice global mix here in the room. If you know anything about Silicon Valley, we're all about innovation and technology company. We, we hang our hats on innovation. So I will relate that to, at least from the DocuSign perspective, why we were, you know, to your point, well, we might be a little skeptical, but why we we're willing to lean into this opportunity is that we, we want to make smart bets around innovation. And when we see capable people and companies with proven track record leaning in and putting their own skin in the game, that, that's a sure sign that it, it's a, you know, whether it's, we're skeptical or not, it's, it's a good bet for us to make. And so I would say just looking for opportunities to come together with you know, like-minded companies, but also companies that you see that are leaning in and to help lean into that along with them even if the, the returns, the immediate rewards are not 100% clear, but toward this overall goal that I know that everyone in this room and, and watching will have, which is the acceleration of how we all tackle, tackle these very, very near-term crises. Patrick, do you have anything to add? Sure, what's changing out there? Um, three things, I think. Uh, one is this, the move of the, of the sustainability professional the, the strategies have to turn exponential from linear. I think we're going to see that crystal clear. Um, climate change is so big and so urgent that the least rational thing to do is to focus resources on incremental improvements that are never going to add up to anything that will bend the curve. And that's been part of what we've all done for many, many years. Think about that slow, methodical change. And some places, um, that methodical change can lead to an exponential impact, um, but, but I think we'll see sort of a, a new mindset around needing to focus on those initiatives that have a chance to deliver planetary scale impact. Uh, number two is the, the, the evolution of the role to be a little bit more of a recruitment effort. Um, we're seeing this, Salesforce has a very passionate culture that understands that business is a platform for change. And what we're seeing from all of our employees are many, many of them coming to our team and really earnestly wanting and feeling compelled to really help in this emergency. And I think um, just like a recruitment office, um, the sustainability team is going to have to match passionate employee with productive work in a way that we've never seen before to really have the scale uh, of the impact that we're after. And then I think the third trend is going to be collaboration. Um, so how do you step up, join step up if you haven't? Um, and with the Salesforce just signed on to a, the one and a half degree pledge and submitted our science-based target with it a really ambitious goal for supply chain activation. And I think um, what we'll see is especially with others who set supply chain engagement goals under the SBTI framework that it creates this really big collaborative supply chain mobilization effort that is probably, to me, the most inspiring phenomenon happening right now in sustainability. Yeah, I'll take that moment to plug Step Up. That's uh, <laughs> Thanks, Patrick. Um, definitely, I think that's, that's an area that is, is not just innovation in tech, but is just all, all of us recognizing that we're on the same team. Um, and we need to make sure that there is a future for us to stay in business for. Um, so competition is, is certainly healthy, but we need collaboration. And thank you both for, for calling that out. Um, that segues really well into my next question, which is, again, more generally asking, do you have any advice that you would give any of the business leaders in this room or who are watching online um, to prepare and position both themselves and their companies well for whatever the future may hold. Well, I I will give Patrick the the last the last <laughs> word, so I'll I'll, di I'll jump in first. Um, so when I, when I think about DocuSign, and then I, I want to share maybe a more personal anecdote. But when I think about DocuSign, and we launched DocuSign for Forests, which, as I mentioned, is our umbrella environmental initiative, our philanthropy, how our people can get involved, how our products make a difference in terms of water, wood, waste, and carbon savings, our operational efficiencies. We launched that. Our, our CEO, Dan Springer, launched that at Davos earlier this year alongside Suzanne DiBianca, Chief Impact Officer at Salesforce, and Jane Goodall, uh, 
of Jane Goodall fame, <laughs> as it turns out. And one of the things that has, uh, has always impressed me about Jane Goodall and her message of hope and peace, despite a lot of heavy, a lot of heavy things going on in the world, is this focus on young people. And I, that is cer certainly a message at DocuSign and with my colleagues at DocuSign, and I know um, Jane Goodall is a, a friend of Salesforce as well, um, that is resonant. And then f how I, you know, when I think about translating that to me a little bit more personally, uh, my son is adopted from the Marshall Islands. Uh, he's two and a half, and it is, um, it's really troubling to think about how if people in this room and beyond, if we all don't come together to reverse this, this, ter this terrible trend that we're on, my son's home country, he, it won't be there anymore. Um, so by 2030, some of the estimates have it being wiped off the map due to sea level rise. So I personally will have a call, personal call to action. And um, Patrick, take, that's all I got. Patrick, take it away. <laughs> I, I think the, the, the most important message is do what you do best. And I think we can all, as ambassadors to the sustainability movement at an individual level, tell people who come to us from our personal networks who want to take action to do what they do best. Um, we need lawyers to do law for climate action. We need artists to make art for climate action. We need journalists to investigate for climate action. Um, and it's true at the individual as well as the community level and the company level. So for those of you doing corporate sustainability strategy, of course you have to get your house in order first, right? Um, to be authentic, to walk the walk. Um, but in parallel, because we don't have time to do anything in series anymore, sadly, um, tap into what your company does best and apply that to the climate emergency. Um, it, it's that thought process um, that really gave birth to Salesforce Sustainability Cloud, right? How do we take our pla technology platform for business transformation and apply that to help all of our customers succeed in their own ways on their own climate journeys? Thank you, Patrick, and thank you, Amy. I think those are great sentiments. Um, business and personal anecdotes to, to end on. Um, I hope that everyone in the room can stick around and, and ask questions of these two um, individuals up here. And we'll also network and talk with others in this space um, and identify how we can all collaborate um, as businesses to make sure that we're doing what's needed to have emissions by 2030, have emissions by 2040, and, and then get to a net zero 2050. It's it's certainly an ambitious challenge that we've set up um, for ourselves by not taking enough action to this point. And so uh, it's, time. I, it's time. It's time. Act now. Um, that's we, we should all leave here feeling emboldened and um, ready to really step up. So thank you all today for joining us. And a big round of applause to Patrick and Amy.